Hello, uh, welcome to ENG 250, week three, part one. Uh, let's, to discuss, let's discuss today Albert Camus, the guest. I want to look briefly at the plot, but then at certain stylistic features of his writing, for example, landscape and ethical, political issues raised by the story. But first, some words about Camus himself. He was born in French colonized Algeria. You need to look this up to familiarize yourself with the political historical context of the story. But briefly, France occupied and colonized Algeria from 1830 to 1962. In fact, it was incorporated into France. It was governed as a region of France rather than as a colony. This began in 1842. The War of Independence began in 1954 and ended in 1962 with Algeria gaining its independence and forming the modern republic. Camus did not come from a privileged background, but he studied philosophy at university, eventually taking his master's degree. He then worked in Algiers, Algiers is the capital city of Algeria, as a journalist, famously writing a long piece on the exploitation of agricultural workers. The authorities were unhappy and he was ordered from Algeria to France, where he lived for the rest of his life. He also, while a young man in Algeria, was involved in theatre. Uh, he wrote several plays, and uh, one of them about football. He was a football player. I think he was a goalkeeper. And uh, uh, he, he wrote and produced plays that, and was involved in theatre companies that tended to take a critical look at politics. In France, he became associated with, a political, with political and philosophical movements of the time. Uh, <clears throat> he is rather loosely associated, associated with what is known as existentialism, a modern philosophy that sought to show that human essence, that is the defining core of human life, is not something that is pre-given, but rather something that emerges historically as humans engage with each other and the environment to form societies and a meaningful life. While he always played down such an association, we see from his writing a concern with how individuals under pressure react in a way that gives life and some kind of meaning to, the, to themselves. <clears throat> but meaningful Camus is seldom based on certainty. There is always a searching, a doubting, some kind of paradox. For example, one would expect Camus as a man of the French left to support Algerians in their fight for independence. This was the case with the French left in general. Camus, on the other hand, by contrast, could not find a position of certainty from which to make his judgment in this case. He was too close to Algerian society, he felt, to take a principled stand. When asked why he did not support Algerian revolutionaries, he answered that he could not support a side that might one day bomb and kill his mother, an old woman, as she sat on the bus after do her shopping. In other words, his position was ambiguous. Yes, yes, the fight against the colonial powers for independence was a good thing, but no, if these fighters endangered the life of his beloved mother, it could not be described as a good thing from his point of view. In other words, on a crucial issue, on crucial issues, he considered all factors that concerned him without trying to resolve the contradictions. This is what can be called a position of deliberate ambiguity. And it's a position that Camus took on many issues, and we can see it uh, running like a thread through the story we're at the moment reading, Camus the guest. <clears throat> Let me just define ambiguity. Ambiguity is the quality that language has of expressing contradictory and plural meaning. 
For example, I could describe somebody as being good, but somehow suggest at the same time, in the same breath, using the same words, that their goodness is too understated, rather limited. This is, of course, irony, but irony is based on the fundamental property of language, of ambiguity. I ask you to note these kinds of ambiguity in Camus' story, The Guest. And let me just give you an example before we start off. Daru is both an element in the colonial power structure, he's a teacher and he is a Frenchman, but at the same time he's tied deeply to the land that is Algeria. <clears throat> The story. Now I'm going to talk about the story in the classical plot terms. I'll talk about exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and denouement. Okay, exposition. Daru, up in the mountains, stands outside the school, looking on as a policeman approaches, leading a prisoner. This is the opening of the story. The prisoner, we learn, is being led to a judge in the town, in the nearby town of Tinguit, where he will almost certainly face the death sentence. The characters are the policeman, or the gendarme, as it's known, the prisoner, and the teacher. Uh, I'd like you to note the landscape as well, the centrality of the landscape and the exposition, the snow, the expansiveness, the cold, the harshness. Rising action. Exchanges take place between Balducci and Daru. The prisoner is observed, in fact, in quite demeaning terms that have the effect of dehumanization. Balducci warns of coming violence. Remember, this story is set in the time of war. So Balducci warns of coming violence uh, and uh, its associated danger to the life of the Frenchman, especially to the life of Frenchmen, especially those who are not protected by the community, those who live out in isolated villages or districts on their own, as does Daru. The prisoner is handed over to Daru, who does not accept to carry out the orders that come from the authorities. Daru refuses according to his code of honour, that is, to a certain to his Code of Ethics, a Code of Ethics that's never really made explicit, that's never really stated. Now, he simply refers to a Code of Honour, or Honour. He, he, he states that it would be dishonourable, it would be against his Code of Honour to hand the prisoner over to certain death. But his insistence, his insistence on this comes at the cost of his friendship with Balducci, whom he admires. Daru, in turn, is admired by Balducci, who sees the younger man as being similar to his own son. The night spent with the prisoner for Daru is fraught with tension. There is the underlying threat of some kind of violence. I mean, there are guns involved. Uh, of course, this violence never eventuates. And actually, as we read on in the story, we realise that it's never going to eventuate. Uh, the, the prisoner is not, in fact, a, a man of violence, despite the fact that he has murdered his cousin. And Daru, the teacher, isn't a man of violence, as it turns out. <clears throat> there is discomfort. There is the discomfort of Daru with his mission as an enforcer of the law. There is Daru's disgust with the Arab's crime, but a sympathy with the man's need for freedom. A right to freedom Daru thinks belongs to everybody, even if they've committed murder. Uh, I want you to note too the amb fundamental ambiguity Daru holds towards the prisoner uh, through Daru's eyes, the prisoner is described in demeaning terms. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
he's described really in the terms of an 18th, 19th century slave master. You know, he's described in dehumanizing terms, terms that render the prisoner a kind of animal, you know, with this intense focus on the shape of his face, his lips, the way he eats, the fear in his eyes. For us as readers, in my opinion, <clears throat> um, this constant tension is underpinned or underlined by the constant tension of Daru's decision. The knowledge that Daru will make a decision, but the uncertainty as to what that decision will be. We know that he has stated to Balducci that he will not deliver the prisoner to his death. Yet we do not know whether he will follow this through. Or if he does follow it through, uh, under what circumstances he will release the prisoner. The climax of the story has to be the release of the prisoner and the choice the prisoner eventually makes. But being a philosophical story, the release comes with a choice. A choice that is transferred onto the shoulders of the prisoner himself. In the end, it is he who must choose his fate, not Daru who must determine the fate of the prisoner. Daru gives him food and money. He instructs him that to the east is the town of Tinguit and the deadly judgment of French law. To the south are nomads, perhaps Bedouin, whose law is one of hospitality in such cases. And of course, we know the choice made by the prisoner. Now, this is the climax of the story. The falling action, Daru walks, Daru releases the prisoner and uh, walks back to his, uh, his, his abode, his classroom. Now we come to the denouement, that is the twist at the end of the story. Let me just stress again, denouement is a very nice French word that means in simple English something like twist. You know? <clears throat> Back in the classroom, after having released the prisoner, Daru reads on the blackboard, and I quote, You handed over our brother, you will pay for this. Unquote. So it seems that while he was away releasing the prisoner, um, the prisoner's people, let us say, uh, who were in search of the prisoner, came to the school, entered the classroom, realized that the prisoner had been handed over to Daru, and speculated that in turn Daru was going to hand the prisoner over to the authorities and swore revenge for what would certainly for their in their minds in the future become the prisoner's death. Now we all get the irony. We all get the twist. Daru hasn't in fact handed the prisoner over to his death. The prisoner has handed himself over to his death. Uh, yet, uh, for those in, in search of the prisoner, this is not the point. In fact, they don't know that Daru uh, gay, gives the prisoner his freedom. They, only, they in the future will only know that the prisoner died, that the prisoner was executed by the authorities. And so, the revenge on Daru if in fact they do take revenge on him, will seem in their eyes to be justified. <clears throat>